Welcome to The Backstory with Dr. Ricky Singh. This podcast is focused on bringing you the latest research-based information about dramatically improving health, well-being, and quality of life. And here's your host, Dr. Ricky Singh. Welcome to The Backstory. And today, listeners, we have a really special treat. Uh, I'm very excited to kick off season two uh, with a very special guest. You know, this last year has been really tough during the pandemic, and a lot of the workforce is returning to work, albeit from home. So we've been seeing a tremendous increase in neck pain, upper back pain. You know, a lot of us have these ergonomic setups at work, but we really don't have the same opportunity at home. We're working on our coffee table or our dining table or even our bed. So we're definitely seeing an increase in the incidence of neck pain, especially here at our Ox Spine Center. So my guest today is the director of cervical spine surgery and co-director of spine surgery at New York Presbyterian's Ox Spine Hospital. And, you know, he's, he's very unique in the sense that he's probably one of only a few surgeons in the entire world that specializes exclusively on the surgical treatment of neck issues. And he's been doing this for the past 20 years. So please welcome my guest today, Dr. Dan Rue. Dr. Rue, welcome to The Backstory. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Singh. It's a pleasure to be here. So, you know, before we get into the topic of neck pain and back pain, I kind of want to hear about your backstory. You know, tell me a little bit about where you grew up, how'd you get interested in orthopedics, and how'd you end up here with us in New York City? So I was born in South Korea, and uh, my family immigrated to the United States when I was seven years old. I grew up in Akron, Ohio, and lived in Ohio until I went away to college, then went back to medical school in uh, Cleveland. And then afterwards, I uh, did an internal medicine residency at New York Hospital, which became New York Presbyterian while Cornell a couple of decades later. And then uh, after finishing an internal medicine residency, I knew that I had been interested in orthopedic surgery as a uh, medical student and then fell in love with cardiology and took a detour. And uh, so I decided to go back into orthopedic surgery and uh, finished a residency and then became interested in spine and uh, did a fellowship with a uh, man named Henry Bowman, who in his generation was considered the, uh, the number one cervical spine surgeon in orthopedic surgery in the world. And uh, that's how I wound up uh, being a cervical spine surgeon. Uh, they recruited me to Washington University in St. Louis to start the cervical spine service there in uh, uh, 1995. And I stayed there from 95 until 2015 when uh, Columbia recruited three of us from Washington University to uh, jumpstart a spine program at uh, Columbia. And then I moved over to uh, Cornell uh, just this past September as part of the expansion of the Ox Spine to include both Columbia University Orthopedics, Columbia University Neurosurgery, as well as Weill Cornell Neurosurgery. So now there are three pieces uh, to this pie, and uh, it's made up of uh, both neurosurgical spine surgeons as well as orthopedic spine surgeons. And then there's obviously non-operating uh, colleagues like uh, yourself as you head up the physiatry component and pain management, physical therapy, all manners of uh, everything from uh, stem to stern and uh, from uh, the least invasive non-operative to the most invasive uh, operative cases are now, now taking care of at Ox Spine. That's right. And we're definitely going to touch on the multidisciplinary center we have here, which I think is, you know, one of a kind in the nation. And we're, we're very fortunate that you did, I want to say come over from Columbia to Cornell, but I think we might need to start thinking about it more strategically as a entire group, a tripartite mission uh, for spine care. So you were in St. Louis for a while, and that's where I was born and raised. Uh, I came to New York City in 2011. I was in St. Louis for most of my life, but I can say I've been outside of St. Louis for more than half of my life now. So that change certainly is different coming from a small Midwest town to uh, the Big Apple. What was that transition like? You know, you, you established yourself in New York, in, in St. Louis, 20 years building the spine service, and now you're here in New York City. What was that transition like? Well, because I had trained actually at New York Hospital, I, I knew a little bit about New York City and was uh, already familiar with it. But of course, when you uh, move your practice, they say that if you move your practice after five years and you stay in town, you'll take about 80% of your practice with you. For me, only about 20% of my practice uh, were patients that were flying from different states and countries to come see me in St. Louis. And so I brought uh, that 20% with me. Uh, but 80% of my patients were from uh, St. Louis and the surrounding, say, about 200-mile radius where they would drive to St. Louis to get their care. 
And so I had to uh, reestablish a practice essentially all over again. Now, I was fortunate in that I had already a number of uh, physicians from New York City and the surrounding area that were referring uh, patients to me in St. Louis. And many of those patients would say, well, uh, do you know somebody that's closer uh, that I can go see (laughs) so that I don't have to travel to St. Louis? And now when I moved here, uh, they said, now that guy is here. And then, uh, and then I found that um, uh, a lot of my patients from St. Louis actually would fly to New York to get their care. And, uh, and then once I moved to New York, the other thing I found was that there were a lot of patients who, when they were told to come see me and I was in St. Louis, would say, you know, I really don't want to go to St. Louis. Can't you find me a doctor somewhere else? But now that I moved to New York, they say, you know, I love New York City. And, uh, and if he's there in New York City, I'm going to come. And so... I found that at this point, something like 35 or 40 percent of my practice is uh, uh, made up of patients who uh, fly or uh, drive more than uh, 200 miles to come see me. So um, it it was not as uh, difficult uh, a time building a practice again in New York as I thought it would be. Right. I think especially, you know, in, in St. Louis, when we used to have TWA Airlines and they're kind of the hub, you could pretty much get anywhere pretty quickly. And once they got taken over by American and then U.S. Airs went under... It was really tough to get to St. Louis. Even now, when I visit my parents, it's not easy to find a nonstop flight, sometimes connecting through Chicago or Charlotte or something like that. So what I'm hearing is that before I decide to leave New York City, I need to build an international reputation so that if I need to rebuild the practice somewhere else, not that I'm intending to do so uh, to you listeners out there, but um, that's what I need to do before I jump ship. You wrote an article, which, which I found very fascinating, especially something we talk a lot about uh, in, on this podcast, about exercise. And the average American exercises about an hour a day, which I found aggressive. You know, I, I didn't know that we as a, as a nation exercise that much. Um, but, you know, we always find an excuse not to exercise. I blame my kids half the time or I blame, you know, I saw so many patients today. I'm tired. I don't want to exercise when I get home. But one thing that we always have time for is picking up our phone scrolling through the endless news feeds of Facebook or Instagram or whatever. You know, some say we pick up our phone 100 to 200 times a day. And you, read a, you wrote a great article and you called something tech neck. So what is, what is tech neck and, and how did you kind of uncover this, this condition? So basically, I think uh, tech neck, the way I look at it, is uh, a problem uh, in the neck that develops as a result of us using technology. And uh, what technology uh, these days means... Uh, uh, it means uh, the use of uh, your uh, cellular phone, your iPad, your your tablet of any kind, your computers, and uh, and people are spending more and more time uh, doing that kind of stuff. And when you do that, you don't tend to pay a lot of attention to your posture, and so you end up often with neck or back problems. And I see this constantly in my patients, and I think uh, with the pandemic, uh, with people spending a lot of time at home and on Zoom and everything else, people are much more prone to developing uh, this tech neck. What's, what's actually happening at the level of the bones and the muscles and some of the soft tissues of the neck when people are looking down and flexing forward? Is there extra stress happening at those structures? Oh, absolutely. So your head weighs uh, somewhere around 15 pounds, give or take, depending on uh, the size of the person. And uh, when you stand up straight and look straight ahead, uh, your head is well balanced on top of your cervical spine. And uh, it's as though if you lock your knee and you stand up, you expend very little energy maintaining that position. But now imagine you're standing up and you start to bend forward at the waist a little bit. Now you're carrying your body weight in front of Uh, If you dropped a straight line from the head, it would fall in front of your feet. So now your back muscles and the back of your, the muscles in the back of your legs have to work overtime to maintain that position. Well, that's essentially what's happening when you bend your neck forward. The muscles in the back of your neck have to strain very hard to uh, hold your head up. If you were to fall asleep in that position, your head would just bob forward and it would just hit your chin to your chest. And uh, so in order to maintain that position, the muscles are straining hard and they're pulling on the back of the head. And when you're doing that, you're also pulling on the joints in the back of your neck as well as the disc in the front of your neck. So if you think about one joint in your neck, it's made up of the disc in the front and two joints in the back of your neck that are called facet joints. It's like a tricycle. It's got this big wheel in the front, which is uh, analogous to the big disc in the front, and it's got these two, two smaller joints in the back of the neck. 
Now, uh, when you age and when you overuse your neck, what happens is the disc can wear out and, and the joints in the back of your neck can also wear out. And that's what can lead to uh, a pain in the neck. Now, the disc can also rupture. And if it ruptures and it pinches a nerve, it can actually cause symptoms that we call radiculopathy, which just is a fancy term for saying there's something wrong with a nerve. It means that you have a pinched nerve, and that pinched nerve can manifest itself as uh, numbness in the arm, weakness in the arm, or pain down the arm. And all of those can happen, but before those things happen, most of the time, people will say, you know, my neck is killing me. They try to massage the back of their neck, they move their neck around, and then what happens is they go right back to uh, using that bad posture. They say, oh, my neck is killing me. And then they look down and continue to work. Right. And uh, that's what exacerbates the problem. You know, it, it's challenging because there isn't an acute traumatic event. You know, no one says, I looked down on my phone and I ruptured my disc or I got this pain shooting down my arm. It sounds like it's a cumulative, repetitive stress type of injury, which makes it a little more challenging for patients to really change their behavior. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens culminated over months and months and months, especially during the pandemic, like you mentioned. It takes time to develop. You know, they have, these, they have these devices like the upright where you put something in between your shoulder blades and it buzzes or rings your phone to make you sit up. Have you seen any of these kind of change the behaviors of your patients or do you, do you support any of these devices? No, you know, I mean, most of my patients uh, have not tried those, uh, uh, those things. And most of my patients haven't actually thought about uh, their posture being the culprit. Uh, I mean, we all know that if we sit on a hard chair and our butt starts to ache, that we stand up. We get some circulation. It stops hurting. And then, unfortunately, you go right back to sitting on that hard chair to continue to work. But when it comes to problems with neck pain, a lot of times people don't think about that. They don't stand up. They just kind of grin and bear it and just work, probably because the pain isn't isn't so bad that it forces them to uh, change something, but it's nagging enough that it, uh, it just, it's a cumulative thing. It's, it's like a, a death by a thousand needles, and uh, you just sit there and grin and bear it hour after hour, day after day, until that posture really ends up causing uh, a, a more serious problem. You, know, you, you mentioned something called um, aging of this disc or gray hairs. You, you've written about that as well. You know, and, and we kind of accept the fact that we are all aging. I'm actually listening to a really good book called Lifespan by David Sinclair from Harvard about the whole process of aging. Maybe that's a disease that we need to talk about in, in addition to cervical disc degeneration. But patients get their MRIs. They see their discs are black. They're not white and juicy like they once were in their 20s and 30s. And I'm guilty of saying it too. I was like, yeah, this is the natural aging process. This is age-related wear and tear. Is that true? Should we just accept the fact that our discs are going to degenerate? Is this why we do shrink with time a little bit with our height? Well, yes and no. It's clear that no matter what you do, you're going to age. Uh, that's an unfortunate fact of life, uh, that uh, we all get older, we all get gray hair, and our discs will degenerate with time. But you can certainly uh, exacerbate it. You can uh, make it worse. You can uh, accelerate that process. It's, it's similar to saying that if you spend a lot of time out in the sun, you'll get a lot more wrinkles. Now, you're going to get wrinkles whether you spend time in the sun or not, but if you spend a lot of time out in the sun, you're going to get wrinkles much faster, and your skin's going to look a lot older faster. And by the same token, if you overstress your discs and your joints, they will wear out faster. There's a wear and tear phenomenon, so it's, uh, it's uh, not uh, the mileage. Uh, it's uh, how you've driven that car. And so if you um, uh, maintain a bad posture, you do bad things to your neck, it's going to start to complain a lot earlier than it would have had you taken good care of it. You know, we, we see a lot of these patients in collaboration at our Ox Spine Center. Uh, and what I, lo what I love about your practice is that you're the first to admit that a lot of patients don't need surgery. Many need non-operative care, such as postural education or some physical therapy interventions. But what, what about those patients who we've tried injections and we've tried physical therapy, we've tried to strengthen their upper back muscles, their rhomboids in between their shoulder blades, and yet they're still developing shooting pain down the arm, something you call radiculopathy, a pinched nerve. So what happens at that point? Are, are patients, can patients get to the point where now we need a surgical intervention because these conservative non-operative treatments have not helped? Yeah, sure. Of course, uh, there are always patients who require surgery, but 95% of patients who uh, develop radiculopathy don't need surgery. Even if you did nothing, uh, most of them will get better. And uh, with modern non-operative treatments such as physical therapy, taking anti-inflammatories, uh, medications that help with nerve pain, and, uh, and especially injections of uh, cortisone, 
epidurals, transforaminal epidurals, facet blocks, radiofrequency ablation. There are so many things that can be done non-operatively to treat radiculopathy. So I, I tell patients, if somebody comes in to see me and they've had radiculopathy for a week, I say, listen, there's a, a better than 95% chance that, uh, that this will all go away and you won't have any of the symptoms left. And of the 5% that are left over, 3 to 4% get better enough that they say, I don't want surgery. So only about 1% or 2% out of all the people who develop radiculopathy end up actually needing surgery. And uh, the problem is that uh, uh, if you are in so much pain, you say, you know, I can't wait, and you don't want to try the non-operative things, you may be getting surgery unnecessarily. Whereas if you wait six or even 12 weeks, you may say at the end of those uh, six or 12 weeks, uh, yeah, and it, you know, had you talked to me six weeks ago, I would have said, I would give my left pinky finger uh, to get rid of this pain, so let's go ahead and operate. But now you say, you know, there's no way I'd want surgery because all my symptoms are better and, uh, and I'm doing perfectly well. So the first thing you should do is try non-operative treatment. Unless you have a profound neurologic deficit, such as a profound weakness or numbness, you can't raise your arm against gravity, for instance, or you have dense numbness that you, can't, you can cut yourself and you don't feel it. Unless you have one of those kinds of conditions, uh, when you have a pinched nerve, uh, you should try non-operative uh, treatment first. So, so you mentioned that sometimes this radiculopathy, which is where the jelly inside that disc can kind of squirt out and touch the nerve, sometimes it self-resolves. And patient asked me, Doc, how is this actually going to get better? So what have you seen? What actually happens to that piece of disc that is pinching the nerve? So there are two things that can happen. Number one, your body uh, begins to attack it as a foreign body because it normally that the inside of the disc, uh, the gelatinous portion, it's only gelatinous when you're young. As you get older, it becomes more like crab meat uh, kind of consistency. So the body isn't exposed to that, so it sees it as a foreign body. So when you rupture that disc, thinking of it like a jelly donut where the inside squirts out, the body starts to attack it, and it sends out inflammatory cells. And those inflammatory cells are what often cause the pain and the weakness and the numbness. So over time, your body gradually gets used to it, and, uh, and the inflammation dies down, and the patient says, I don't have the symptoms. Now, when you repeat an MRI in somebody like that, sometimes the disc it looks exactly the same as it did when the patient was suffering in pain. So it tells you it's not just a ruptured disc. It's not the physical act of that disc pushing on the nerve that causes the symptoms. It's the inflammation that, is, that accompanies it. And that's why on a good day, when the patient says, I don't have any pain. And on a bad day, when the patient says the pain is just absolutely, it's a 12 on a scale of 1 to 10, you get MRIs in those two days, it looks exactly the same. It's the inflammation. It's, there, it's, it's due to biochemicals that you cannot see on an MRI scan. Now, so sometimes that MRI, you look at it six months later, the disc is completely gone, and, uh, and you don't see it because the body has actually resorbed it. All of those... Uh, inflammatory cells have come, and like Pac-Man, they have gobbled up all of the uh, uh, disc material. But sometimes the disc looks exactly the same as it did, and nothing has resorbed. And sometimes that disc will actually even uh, calcify or turn to bone over a period of years. Now, uh, regardless of whether it's gotten better because the body's resorbed it or it's gotten better because the inflammation has died down and the disc remains exactly the same, the symptoms go away. So we don't really care which way you get better. All we care about is the fact that you have actually gotten better. Patients always ask me, you know, Doc, I am feeling better. Should we get an updated MRI to look at what the disc looks like? And I say the same thing you say. I was like, we don't, we, we don't treat pictures. We treat you, the patient, and if you're feeling better and you're not weak and you don't have this dense numbness, then let's monitor you. And if patients, if symptoms come back, you know, we'll, we'll address it at that point. So let's talk about that one to 2% of, of patients that quote fail conservative treatments. I don't like saying fail because maybe I failed them or, or what have you, but now they need surgery. So you, you know, you're probably one of the world's leading experts on cervical artificial disc replacement. Tell our listeners, what is artificial disc replacement and, and how'd you kind of learn about this and become interested in it? So uh, most people have heard about artificial hip replacement and artificial knee replacement, and uh, those have been around since uh, the 1950s. And uh, you know that when you have an arthritic uh, hip, you can uh, take out that arthritic joint and replace it with a prosthesis that mimics what your uh, natural hip used to do. And uh, so also starting in the 1960s, there was a guy uh, named Fernstrom, and uh, Fernstrom took these uh, uh, metallic balls 
and he would take the disc out and put it in place of the disc. And it's been rumored that John F. Kennedy had that procedure done uh, on a yacht on the East River uh, at one point and had uh, some of these uh, Fernstrom balls uh, placed in his lower back. And they lasted for years, but uh, it's been a holy grail of uh, spine surgeons to find a way to repair or replace the disc, both in the cervical spine as well as in the lumbar spine. And so people have been looking at it all the way back to the 1960s. Um, But it wasn't until really about the 1990s that they started developing artificial discs uh, made of uh, stainless steel and then subsequently of uh, titanium and uh, cobalt chromium uh, with uh, uh, polyurethane cores. And now there um, there are a lot of different artificial discs that are out there and uh, several that have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. And I've been putting in artificial discs. Uh, my first one was in 2002. So um, uh, we've been doing it for almost 20 years now. And, uh, and the amazing thing is in the right candidate, and unfortunately a lot of patients are not good candidates, uh, but in the right candidate, um, it's a, an amazing uh, device. Uh, I have professional athletes who have these and go back to uh, uh, doing things like UFC fighting. And uh, uh, I have Olympic gold medalists who are uh, doing uh, what they used to do before. Surgeons who would have the surgery and go back to work the very next day and uh, uh, go back to lifting weights uh, overhead and things like that without the need for any uh, uh, collar immobilization. And so it, it really is an excellent uh, technique that's only been around for the last, say, 20 years. Uh, but I think uh, if you're the right candidate, and, and by w- the right candidate, what I mean is that you don't have a lot of arthritis. You tend to be younger, 20s, 30s, and uh, 40s. Typically, by the time you're in your 50s or 60s, you're not a good candidate. If you have osteoporosis, as a lot of postmenopausal women have, you're not a good candidate. If you have a lot of arthritis in the back of your neck or collapse of the disc space, you're not a good candidate. If you have bone-forming diseases um, that form a lot of uh, bone spurs around your spine, you're not a good candidate because uh, you take those spurs out and the body will grow them right back. Uh, Bone spurs are like calluses of your hand. As long as you keep doing manual labor, they'll come back. And so if you remove the bone spurs and you preserve motion, they often will grow right back and the patients will become symptomatic again. So ACDF, which is anterior cervical discectomy infusion, that's kind of, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's the gold standard for someone with um, spinal cord compression or nerve root compression caused by things that we've talked about already. And it's got a very long track record. We kind of know the failure rate going forward. Where does this cervical disc replacement kind of sit next to this ACDF procedure? So both are excellent procedures. Both work really well. And um, so when we started doing artificial discs, I would tell patients that I really think it's going to decrease the incidence of the next level breaking down and requiring surgery. We call that adjacent segment uh, pathology or adjacent segment disease. And I used to think that there was going to be about a 30% reduction in adjacent level disease uh, with the artificial disc because we're maintaining motion. And we all thought that adjacent level disease was due to what we were doing to the patient, infusing them with an ACDF. ACDF is an operation that's been around, again, since the 1950s. It has an incredibly uh, great track record of taking away symptoms. Uh, But we thought that by fusing it, the next level would break down. Well, unfortunately, uh, we published a paper a couple of years ago that showed that at 10 years, the difference between a single-level artificial disc or a two-level artificial disc versus a single-level or two-level fusion, at 10 years, there was only a 5% difference between the artificial disc and the fusion in terms of how often those patients would need surgery at the next level. So unfortunately, adjacent level, yes, the artificial disc beats it by a small amount, but it really is a small amount. It's only about 5%. Uh, The other advantage for the artificial disc is it maintains motion. But in the United States, we can only do one or two levels because only one or two levels are approved by the FDA. So insurance will not pay for more than one or two levels. So if you do a one-level ACDF versus a one-level fusion, the motion preservation of the artificial disc is so small. It's only about uh, uh, about uh, six to seven millimeters. That's about a quarter of an inch of up and down motion, which is negligible. Left and right, you save about seven degrees of left and right motion, which again is negligible. So if I put an artificial disc in you and I put a, a, a fusion in your twin brother, you'd never know which one got which. Even at two levels, you might barely be able to tell. So motion preservation isn't a big 
advantage for artificial disk. Unless you're getting to four and five levels, you're not going to notice a difference. The main difference, I would say, is that in a younger person, you get back to activities a little bit faster and that you preserve a tiny bit of motion. And and finally, you have a slightly lower incidence uh, of adjacent level reoperation rates. Yeah, you know, we talk about that, about a lot about that in our clinic. You know, patients are worried about getting a fusion. And I, and I quote the literature regarding the lumbar spine. You know, adjacent segment disease is probably at the rate of about 3% per year. So if you're a young person in your 30s, you know, there's a 90% chance over the next 30, 40 years, you might need another surgery. It sounds like in the cervical spine, the data is a little bit less just because the loads on the spine are not the same as in the lumbar spine. Uh, what about complications with this surgery compared to uh, a conventional ACDF surgery? Uh, they were roughly the same, the, 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 but the complications were different. So, for instance, the, uh, the fusion, the most common complication was that the bone wouldn't heal and you would need a second operation at the same level. For the artificial disc replacement, the most common reason that you had to take out the artificial disc is that the surgeon did an inadequate job of decompressing the spine. So it was an inadequate decompression. So it was a surgeon technical error. And I see that all the time. I mean, there are a lot of surgeons who are novices at putting in artificial discs. Uh, They're not comfortable doing a very thorough decompression all the way out to what we call the uncovertebral joint, which is a, a joint that's right next to your vertebral artery. And, uh, and so if you're not comfortable going out there, you're not going to be able to do a thorough decompression. So the patient wakes up, they still have symptoms, they still have nerve pain, it never gets better, and uh, you end up needing to take it out and do a fusion. And so uh, in a study that we did, as well as uh, studies that others have done, the number one complication is inadequate decompression requiring surgery. Now, there are other potential complications. You can get bone formation that causes that uh, disc to actually go on to fuse. And that can happen again. Part of it is technical error. If the surgeon doesn't irrigate out all the bone dust after doing all the milling, that bone dust acts as a nidus uh, for uh, a fusion process. So there are a lot of little tips and tricks that uh, you have to use. And I I, I did a um, a webinar, and I I think it's out there still. Uh, You can look at it on YouTube that shows how to avoid um, complications with cervical spine surgery. And that's geared towards uh, cervical spine surgeons. You know, once you've selected the patient, the correct patient for this artificial disc replacement, are there things that you tell them to better prepare for surgery? You know, we, in in rehabilitation medicine, we call it prehab. We like, let's get your hips and knees stronger before a total joint arthroplasty so you'll recover faster. Are there similar things in the cervical spine? Do you talk about diet or even smoking or monitoring their, their blood sugars? Anything to optimize their recovery? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we work hand-in-hand hand with their primary care doctors to optimize their medical uh, care. And uh, uh, we tell everybody that they should quit smoking cigarettes. If they're diabetics, they should get their uh, sugars under control. Now, one thing about smoking is that it not only causes the surgery to go badly, but uh, it increases your likelihood of needing surgery on your cervical spine, uh, both with the index first operation and also with subsequent operations. So if you're a smoker, quit smoking because uh, that's one thing you can do to help uh, make your uh, uh, discs and your spine last longer in addition to every other part of your body. So we also recommend that patients try to stay as aerobically fit as possible because aerobic fitness not only decreases your overall pain, it increases your pain tolerance. It also uh, makes you uh, much healthier so that uh, uh, when you do undergo surgery, um, you have a lowered risk of uh, complications related to the medical parts of uh, the operation. You know, you mentioned something earlier about the comprehensive care that we have here at New York Presbyterian Columbia Cornell through our Ox Spine Center. Uh, and, and I value the relationships that I've, I've built with you and our neurosurgeons, other orthopedic colleagues in pain management. Tell me about how this center is different from other centers where you've worked and what's the real value that you see in in collaborating on patient care to get the best outcomes? Well, I can tell you because we work hand-in-hand with uh, non-operating doctors and with uh, pain management, uh, with uh, physical therapy, and we're all a, it's a one-stop shop, basically. Uh, You come to uh, our center at Cornell, for instance, at 59th Street, or at the Columbia at the Ox Spine, or at their 51st Street location, what ends up happening is that everybody is there. 
So if a patient comes to me and they're from Houston and, uh, and they need uh, an injection, I walk over to your office and, and say, hey, Dr. Singh, uh, do you think you can evaluate this patient? And you always say yes. So you look at them, you, you say, I think we can do this for you. And then you can walk over to a physical therapist and say, look, I would, I'd like you to uh, work with uh, this person and uh, give them physical therapy a, a couple of sessions before they uh, return back to uh, their hometown. And so it's very convenient for the patients to, uh, to get all of that. Uh, the other thing is that I, I, I tell patients when they ask me, listen, I, I'm from Philadelphia, and who should I go to? I'd say, you don't want to go to an academic institution. Here's why. Doctors are like everybody else. You know, physical therapist, whether you're a plumber, whether you're an electrician, they're great plumbers and great uh, electricians, and there are terrible plumbers and terrible electricians. It's the same thing with surgeons, physiatrists, pain management people, physical therapists, psychologists, you name it. But one thing you get at a top-notch academic institution is that the worst person, the absolute worst person at Cornell and Columbia is still way, way above average. The worst person at Cornell and Columbia is very, very good. And, uh, and it's that way in many, many academic centers. And so if you go to somebody that's out in private practice, they may be phenomenal. They may be terrible, but you have no way of knowing. But in an academic institution like Cornell or Columbia, you know you're getting some of the best, the best of the best, and, uh, and, and that you can't go wrong with anybody that you see at one of these institutions. So it's so easy when somebody comes to me uh, and I say, you know, you you don't really need surgery, but if you have extra time, I can introduce you to somebody that can actually take care of you non-operatively because they can do a much better job with the non-operative care than a surgeon can because we focus in on the surgical part and the non-operating doctors focus in on the non-operating part. So the non-operating doctor's goal is to get you better without sending it to a surgeon. So that's why we really encourage all patients to first try non-operative care. I think that's what we've learned here in our center, and we could probably do a better job of reporting the outcomes of the patients that we see. Right now, it's somewhat anecdotal. You know, I see a patient that needs surgery, I send them to you, and vice versa. And I think certainly the patient care experience has improved as a result of this collaboration. Well, Dr. Rue, I know you're a very, very busy surgeon. I know you have cases lined up today, so I do thank you for your time and coming to speak with us about something that you're obviously very, very passionate about, the cervical spine. Uh, We'll certainly share your information with our listeners regarding our YouTube and the various webinars and educational programs that you've put out. Uh, So thank you, Dr. Rue. You're obviously world-renowned in spine surgery. Thank you to the listeners for tuning into the backstory. And remember, when it comes to your health, we here at Oxpine, we have your back. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening to The Backstory. Please subscribe rate the podcast and review the backstory on apple podcast spotify and google play music and feel free to share this podcast on social media or even your own website or blog this podcast is for general information purposes only it does not constitute the practice of medicine including the giving of medical advice no doctor patient relationship is formed the use of this information is at the user's own risk the content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice To learn more about Dr. Singh and his clinical research, please follow him on social media. You can also sign up for his newsletter by going to www.rickysinghmd.com. That's R-I-C-K-Y-S-I-N-G-H-M-D.com.